Donald Trump uh, secured a major endorsement from Viktor Orban. Hungary's Prime Minister Orban supports Trump after Florida meeting. From Reuters, Hungary's right-wing nationalist Prime Minister Viktor Orban lends his support to longtime ally Donald Trump's bid to return to White House after meeting the former U.S. president in Florida late on Friday. The two discussed a wide range of issues affecting Hungary and the United States, including the paramount importance of strong and secure borders to protect the sovereignty of each nation, according to a statement from Trump's campaign. Orban has long been at odds with his fellow European Union members over a range of issues, including refusing to send weapons to Kiev and keeping up economic ties with Moscow since Russian forces invaded Ukraine in 2022. Orban has said only the return of Republican candidate Trump to the White House could bring peace in Ukraine. If you remember, we covered this a while back. Tucker Carlson actually went to interview him and he said, you know, Trump is our only hope for world peace. So Orban tweets this out after his visit. It was a pleasure to visit President Real Donald Trump today. We need leaders in the world who are respected and can bring peace. He is one of them. Come back and bring us peace, Mr. President. I got to say, Donald Trump, it was kind of rude not to retweet that. I know you're trying to boycott Twitter for Truth Social, but, you know, the guy comes, he gives you an endorsement, he tags you. You were tagged. You have no excuse. You were tagged. Come on. Give him a retweet. Give the man a retweet. He's putting himself out on the line for you here. Orban, maybe, maybe, maybe he's saving it for the, uh, for the Republican convention. Yeah, maybe. That'll, that'll yeah. be his first tweet. His first tweet. Well, he tweeted out the picture of his mugshot. Right. He actually oh, went. Oh, yeah, did he, he tweeted that? Did out. He? Oh, yes. so he has gone. He on has X. gone back. But that was it. That oh, was it. That was the only and time. And then he didn't do it back. again. And then he didn't do go, do it again. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Orban, admired by many conservatives in the United States for his tough policies on immigration, his family support schemes and vocal stance on national sovereignty, said in a video on his Facebook page that under Trump's 2017 to 2021 presidency, there was peace in the Middle East and also Ukraine. Victor is a great leader, respected all over the world, Trump said on Saturday in a post on his Truth Social messaging platform, saying it had been an honor to host Orban. It was an honor having Victor Orban and his lovely daughter Flora as my guest last night at Mar-a-Lago. Victor is a great leader, respected all over the world. Hungary is a safe place because of his strong immigration policies, and as long as he is in charge, it always will be. So... <laughs> Look, we go back and forth because on the one hand, yes, Trump passed tax cuts for the rich. He kept the military budget bloated, more bloated than ever. He brags about he that. He gave them more money than they asked for. Yes. So on the other hand, so on one hand, you think, well, come on, like how threatened re really are they by him? And on the other hand, you see a thing like this, and this is something that is just complete. like, this is the kind of shit that is just completely out of bounds. You notice how APAC doesn't take 90%. You have to be 100% pro-Zionist for APAC not to come after you. Apparently, the deep state is like that, because you cannot imagine a president uh, who is in bounds in their eyes hosting a guy like Viktor Orban, who is just not with the program because he is a nationalist. He is not a globalist sort of post-borders leader. And um, that seems to be what scares and offends the deep state most about Donald Trump. And it's not a surprise that Orban is supporting Trump, but as the general election campaign kicks off, uh, for him to come here make a show of his visit here and then leave with a formal endorsement saying that uh, Trump is what stands between us and World War Three. You know, that really sets the tone for the campaign, which is very much going to be on the domestic front, the weaponization mm -hmm. of the government against the people and mm -hmm. on the international front, the weaponization of the EU and the World Economic Forum uh, against people in their countries who want their countries to A, represent them, and B, not entangle them in bullshit rich men's wars with other countries. And so I think that sets the tone for the campaign on the foreign policy front. Like, it makes total sense that he would endorse him. But this was obviously a big show. Well, what they're characterizing... Um, what the establishment broadly termed is characterizing as a right wing uh, fa move towards fascism. 
it, it may very well be in some respects. Uh, you want to blame somebody for that? Look in the fucking mirror. Right. If 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 you had delivered, if your liberal order had delivered for people, if it were composed of anything more than virtue signaling, uh, funneling money to you and your criminal friends. Um, and imposing a value system on the general public under the premise of uh, climate change, which I'm not denying climate change, but it seems like the solutions all rest on the backs of people who can ill afford the kinds of reforms you're suggesting and uh, do nothing to really punish the corporations that uh, in, in the end make up your class and are responsible for most of the greenhouse gases. Um, you know, there, there was, I was reading an article the other day about how, you know, bugs are full of parasites and pathogens that you really cannot get out. You know, the whole, you're going to eat bugs thing. Like that's not really going to work. It doesn't deliver nearly as much protein as meat does. Uh, but you know what? I bet Jeff Bezos will have meat. Bill Gates will have meat. That's really a big part of what people are reacting to. So do you have people who are basically authoritarian in their instincts riding a legitimate populist backlash, a legitimate, legitimate populist response to an elite class really trying to turn the public into techno serfs who bow their heads to what's good for them as received wisdom from their superiors. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, but it looks very attractive compared to what you're offering. And when the left has tried to offer an alternative populism, as in the case of the Sanders campaign or Corbyn in England, you have used your considerable cultural and media power to destroy those movements. So now it's like water. It's going to find its level. It's going to find a way, right? It'll wear through rock over time. It's You can't hold it back forever. So you're not letting it express itself in a left direction. It's going to come through in a right-wing direction. That's your own fault. Yes. Yeah. That That's absolutely true. And I think that um, the anti-war sort of element of that um, is is going to become more an issue in this election than I thought it would. And that is because of Israel-Gaza. Even though that conflict is likely to be over, I shouldn't say it's a conflict, even though that genocide is likely to be over by then, um, because there's just not much of Gaza left, unfortunately, um, I think the stain of this and the trauma of this is going to put foreign policy in, in people's minds um right. in a way that it right. hasn't been in a while right. now that's not to say now don't you know you know because i know what's going to happen we're going to see the exit polls you know in november come back immigration economics were the top two yes those will be the top two right but i think foreign policy will probably crack the top five this year which is high for foreign sure. policy. sure sure yeah usually people think it's going to be very high and it's always like 10 yeah it's always yeah yeah, very, very low. But I think it will be higher this year uh, I agree. Be because of that, because so much of the Democrat exodus from Joe Biden on the young voter side and on the Arab voter side is over that issue. Right. Um, and uh, it's just amazing. You know, you see a leader like Trump, you see a leader like Orban meet up and uh, come out of it with a message of, you know, peace. And like I said, we've done a million segments on this, so I don't have to repeat this over and over again. But I'm not saying that Donald Trump is a man of peace. But the idea that his vision of international relations is more dangerous to the world than the people running the world now, that is just suicidal and psychotic. Well, and, and you know what? This is getting a little deep. But I, I think a lot of us on on the more left side, um, particularly if you're a science fiction geek, have had this have always thought this vision of like a united nation that effectively governs the world would be like Star Trek, right? It would be like the Federation. And we've always thought of that as a good thing. But increasingly we're seeing, no, that would be a terrible thing. That would be a terrible thing. So actually the kind of national autonomy, I mean, that is an element of what people like Orban represent and what Trump 
represents here, the idea that nations should be free to go their own way and govern themselves, and there should be limits to that kind of global governance. They're right, because the problem with that kind of global governance is if it goes in a bad direction, there is no competing ideology or government. There's no place to go. You of want course. there to be counterbalancing philosophies and ideologies. So the idea of a world government is actually very bad for the progress of humanity, and it's very bad for people. I, I think people, particularly liberal, the conservatives always had that skepticism. But the left has tended to be more amenable to the idea in a very idealistic way that it would be this, you know, global, uh, multicultural, co no, it, we're seeing what it looks like. We're seeing from the EU what the flaws are in this idea, because when the EU decides they want to make a hate speech law, that's terrifying. It's terrifying because it has such a broad impact. Well, even beyond that, I mean, once capitalism becomes as dominant as it is, that alone becomes a huge threat. Like if you, there, um, our old friend Joe Brunoli wrote this piece for our blog years and years ago. You might want to republish it because it's a think piece. It's kind of evergreen, and he made a strong case that it was actually communism that pulled the American left to the left um, during the Cold War and after World War II. That that. One of the reasons why the Democratic Party has gotten so much shittier in these past 40 years is because there was no ideological competitor on the world stage to neoliberalism. So like, you know, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, Democratic leaders had to make more concessions to labor because there was this other major force on the a, world right. stage that centered labor and they didn't want right. communist movements getting a foothold right. here and they knew that it would if they didn't provide right. so that gave capitalism an incentive to rein itself in a little bit right once right. the soviet union fell capitalism was just unleashed it was the end of history right. there was no right. longer any ideological competition right and we've seen the results of that obviously right. and so nationalism as it's called creates ideally that similar competing dynamic where you have a place to go or a place that has its own system set up to challenge your system when your system either goes sour or runs amok or needs to be reined in right right well well and also this is something that uh jared diamond gets into in uh, guns germs and steel um in regions where you have a lot of competing principalities like Europe, it's impossible for one bad idea to take down the whole society because there will be a competing country next door that adopts the better idea. And so the worst idea, there's a competition of ideas when you have different national boundaries like that in proximity to each other. You did have some principalities that outlawed firearms. Right. How do you think they did against the neighboring principality that didn't? Right. Um, whereas regions that have been more unified have also tended to be more stagnant. Please clap.